I'm a big 1989 fan and I'm playing, how come you're not doing your QBR, EBR cadence and things like that? And they're like, when we have an implementation, it's like a bomb goes off. Like nobody knows the product better than the implementation and the support teams. Cause they, and so when we think about personalities and good EQ, are you able to hear what the customer needs to do and then translate that in your software so that they can see some immediate value? This is the Launch Station, the only place you need to look for all things onboarding, implementation, and customer success. Tune in for insights from industry experts every week. Hey everyone, welcome to yet another episode of the Launch Station. Today we have with us a guest who I think uh, a lot of you in the implementation onboarding space would already know. It's uh, Jeff Kushmerik. He's the founder and CEO of Infinite Renewals. He spent over 20 years in post-sale organizations in tech companies, including firms like Endeka and Brightcurve, where he actually helped these companies launch with their customers, get them to a happy place, building their implementation teams and professional services teams. Welcome, Jeff. Oh, thanks so much for having me. And I'll, I'll tell all the guests that uh, and they'll, if they're in the States, they'll know today's, uh, if there's any communication issues, it's because it's Taylor Swift day and uh, everybody's about to start logging on trying to buy Taylor Swift tickets in, in my area. So uh, it might bring the internet down. And my wife has a series of, uh, of uh, laptops all, all set up, but uh, I think we're going to be okay. So. Awesome. Today's topic that we're going to chat with Jeff Kushmerik about is since he's been part of setting up that first implementation team, PS team in a variety of companies. It's it's about staffing your first onboarding team. How do you go about doing that? That's going to be the core. Uh, mm -hmm. But before we go there, what's your favorite Taylor Swift, Swift song? <laughs> wow. Um, there's so many. Uh, um, I can't name the ones off the new one um, because they're really good, but um, I'm a big 1989 fan and I'm, I play in a band on the weekends and uh, we used to do um, I Knew You Were Trouble. I'm a big fan of that song. So that's I'll go with that one. But there were some other ones from her Redemption album. She's just amazing. She's like the Beatles, right? She's just she's very, I, I'm not going to make fun of her at all. She's just super talented and, um, and uh, a great artist. So, and yeah, high quality. Absolutely. <laughs> Perfect. What's yours? <laughs> <laughs> 1989 is definitely on, on the list for me as well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, maybe, you know, uh, you are helping a whole bunch of companies as they mm -hmm. set up their onboarding teams, implementation teams. Yeah. Maybe start off with telling us about what got you into all of this. Oh, well, um, I was a developer that talked too much. That's what got me into a lot of it. But um, no, I um, for where I'm currently at, Interestingly, we talked about Brightcove and uh, sorry, and Deca and Brightcove and Deca was on premise installations, which we dealt with a lot of the same issues um, where everything was a professional services. You went and installed it. You walked away and hope to renew three years later. Um, I'll, it's so Brightcove was the first company where I was setting this up for a SaaS company, which, <laughs> you know, you probably remember these days. Or, I don't know. You might not be old enough, but like. If you were in professional services and you were on, you were on, everything was on premise, you, there was a build you loved. Like, oh, they just released 5.0. You're like, no, I'm sticking with 4.7. 7. 4.7 7 is good. Then SaaS came around, and then it's like everything changes all the time. Um, so we realized that we we had to work in sort of a different model. You had to interact more with the dev team and things like that. Um, then when I went to um, so after the Brightcove IPO, did some startup stuff, and then went to. Um, Virgin Pulse, uh, which um, you know, if people don't know, it's you know it's, they sell to large employee populations. They give you a Fitbit and if, or you know their own device, and if you do all this good stuff and good activity and sleep well, you'll get you know bonus points and uh, you know uh, health fund dollars and things like that. Um, and that was an incredibly complex thing because if you think about it, you're getting data in from watches, you're dealing with payroll systems and all the you know large companies and things like that. And that's when we realized that you we needed to start building actual separate implementation teams from from the CSM group. It's around like 2014 or so. So uh, you know you'd walk around and you'd talk to CSMs. 
and they go like, hey, how come how come you're not doing your QBR, EBR cadence and things like that? And they're like, when we have an implementation, it's like a bomb goes off in our life, right? And it's very hard for us to focus on this sort of day in and day out stuff. I don't care what the Gainsight playbook says. Uh, well, we had Gainsight, but your CSP uh, playbook um, says we, we just can't um you know find the time to focus on these things because they're large and complex so so that's that was the turning point for me it was kind of evolving the professional services the project management um working inside of technology and architecture on both ends your customer and your company um in my former development background just sort of seeing all those corollaries and that's I just just uh, just liked really liked doing that aspect of things so much so that um, uh, I started the company three years ago or so because that's the thing that I like doing is going in and fixing these types of problems versus say like managing these things two years later and and stuff like that. So yeah, great. And and you know when you were setting all this up at uh, Bright Curve, um, can you tell us a little bit about what that journey was like setting up that team, what were some things that you learned through that process? What were mistakes that we made early on? Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll differentiate Brightcove from some of the others because it's just been an evolution in some SaaS technology stuff. Well, just the way we approach the issues. Brightcove was we would do everything for you and then we would hand over to the CSMs. Um, so that, and that model worked really, really well. Um, you, you know, there, there were some like configuration stuff where we would need, we did all our streaming through Akamai, so we'd have to go talk to Akamai and get things set up. But then I, I will say we were lucky for a very technical product that for a lot of the very like configuration types of issues, there was already uh, thought to put into administration. Um, lots of startups, that it's kind of the last thing that gets done, right? It's like, you know, I hope you know how to write, you know, config codes and things like that, uh, get into the code and write your configuration. Whereas, um, you know, just with all the, we were already modularized by the time the services team was being created because we went from, we're lucky that version 1.0 was already being turned into 2.0. So they knew that there needed to be bells and whistles and check boxes and things like that in admin panels. Um, so, so we were very, very fortunate in that fact. That team actually, we still had to do a lot of development. So we had project managers, um, Java developers, .NET developers, uh, QA teams, um, because we weren't just setting up their use of the system. They were all, I would say 90% of our customers were also creating an experience. So we had to almost treat it like, like like a customer of ours was Fox TV and they wanted to you know, the use case when you go in and do your use case was like I got home and I forgot to record 24 um, which was a show and the hot show at the time and we want to go watch 24 online so we need to connect with my cable provider get credentials and go in and watch it like some very cool stuff um that's that but those things are now more relegated to like a straight professional services team aspect um so i've seen from from there on um there's been a big separation from what i would call professional service via versus implementation um or in versus cs and you know if you're looking at an overall ownership that a chief customer officer has um you know I see it as professional services being one of the organizations along also with support and a CS group, as well as implementation, perhaps customer marketing and education, all of these post sale groups, um, um, not all blending into one. I've got a lot to say on that subject. I was hoping to get in and talk uh, uh, about this uh, newfound passion of mine, which is how to staff your startup. Absolutely. I think oh, yeah. uh, the thing you've been doing with the consulting company, obviously, is go in there and help those companies which are very early started set up yep. things you know form that team so yeah tell us more about oh, yeah. uh, and, what and sort of variety you're seeing note, there. i i will say um I'll, we do deal with even some pre-revenue companies when they're just about to start dealing uh selling and they want to be able to to fulfill which is great um and you know all the way up through series c series d companies it seems when companies have an event they have an opportunity to sort of restack the deck 
make sure that everything's getting set up for their next level of scaling. Um, so that being said, it's usually the same problems, just amplified <laughs> with a lot more numbers involved and things like that. But the the, the beginner startup, um, you know, it, it goes a little, what I'm about to say goes a little bit against what you might even see myself posting a lot or all the sort of conventional wisdom with a lot of the, the you know, very recognized names and customer success because if you're a startup and you just want, sold one deal, two deals, you might have two companies going through implementation. What does that person look like, right? Um, that, so that person usually is a generalist. And this unfortunately is where the whole a CS person winds up doing a ton of support tickets and doing it like, like it's a very brief period in time. I think I have an article out there called uh, Natural Evolution of, of the Implementation Teams or something. Um, and it talks about like that's kind of the role that you need you know it's um uh it's hard to hire a csm when they would just be managing over one customer <laughs> or not right so great that first customer went live it's usually the executives that are managing that relationship at that point in time uh you know as you know friends of the board or friends of the ceo you got your first batch of customers uh, to sign up for some of those types of reasons. Um, so what usually winds up happening is that you have a generalist, um, but you definitely need to see, uh, and I'm trying not to give the classic, it depends answer, um, but you definitely, what type of product do you have, right? Um, if you're, as, as I say, coin operated, where you put your credit card in and get some code or you get access to a, to a, to a nice learning system and you're good to go, um, you might be okay with just a resource that is just there to check in and make sure that they're okay, kind of like a tech touch approach. Um, what I deal more with are companies that are dealing with um, B2B, uh, so they're SaaS B2B and they're selling to other organizations. And there are typically, you've got, I'd say three things to deal with. The first one is that your product's not done being built yet. I alluded to that with the uh, you know admin admin and configuration, but sometimes you know not everything's there, and customers are saying, "Can we have that?" You might be project managing the product team and the developers, or you might be have so that might be a person that's got really good project management experience, and that you just need somebody who's a really good project manager. Um, you might. Uh, you know, a very good model that I've seen for this type of role is um, if you remember the old days where we had a developer, like a Java developer and a project manager on, on custom services projects, I like using that same thing for this example um, because it scales really well. If you have, uh, you're dealing with integrations, you're dealing with uh, data cleansing, ETL, importing of massive amounts of data, which there's a lot of, you know, there's, that's a, that can bring an e-company down. It's a, it's, if you don't approach it correctly. Um, and, um, and, uh, you know, integrating with, you know, all the different systems that are out there. Right. Um, and thank God for the now thing, tools like Zapier and things like that, which makes it a little easier, but when you're needing to deal with those types of technical aspects and configurations, it's good to have a resource that can be a little bit more technical. They, they don't necessarily have to be developers. It's good if they do have that development sort of background. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's very good to think about this, like I've got a project manager type who's managing the customer, managing the software that you're using to manage the customer, whether it be Rocket Lane or Google Sheet or, or whatever it is. Um, and uh, you never want your developer type, your configurator types to basically be doing that sort of project management aspect. Um, they're typically cost more, like usually sometimes a lot more. Um, but in general, they're not the type of people who are have the EQ or the type of sub personalities to be running status meetings, sending out status reports, chasing files down and things like that. So I really like, even if you're signing up your first customer to try and split up the the, the project manager and the configurator type um, to, to, to do that. And, and then a project manager can handle probably like four to six, depending on your level of complexity. That the six is very high for some people, but sometimes you talk to them, they're like, no, we can do 15. We're just checking in, making sure that they're done. Um, 
so that's my startup thing um, with that. It, it's also uh, a, it's a question on what's the model that you're using. Um, are you doing the configurations for the customer or are you putting them through a learning experience and then they're doing the work? Whereas in say like week one, go watch this video in our learning system or go talk to our trainer. So trainer is a good person to have. Um, and and uh, and then when you're done with that, now you can go import your data. Oh, you, you want to use our, uh, you know, let's say that you're doing like a, um, you know, a, a, something with a storefront or something, you've got a commerce solution. Um, now you're going to learn how to tailor that. And so here's a video on that or whatever your solution happens to be. There's that learn and do, learn and do um, model um, versus the you're going to go configure, uh, configure all of these systems for them. Absolutely. And I think, you know, that that makes sense that having been through the experience I uh, <laughs> and, and last year is when we launched our product, uh, I, I would say, once we had that muscle built, it really did help in terms of getting those launches done faster, knowing how to really navigate the customer arc to get things done without, you know, and I think when you start doing things more formally with them, they tend to reciprocate that back with you as right. well. So that's definitely something we've seen work. That, that's a great observation. Uh, if, if you treat them in a professional and formal manner, then they'll they'll respond as such. So absolutely, yeah. One thing I want to note too is that I see as a classic mistake is that um, uh, you know it's a startup you can't really manage people too too tight or you know everybody's just very very busy. But I see a lot of organizations hiring junior roles um, like hey here's our project associate is a classic one that I see. But if you're trying to get you know your good fast TTV for your customers um you're, you're gonna burn out with junior people they're not able to sort of navigate that water especially if we're dealing with enterprise you don't want to hey your your business is very valuable to us here's our junior two years out of college person right you know so i i typically call these roles program managers because it gives that element of like program management and we can handle things on that level and it makes the customer feel like yes we're an enterprise customer or we're mid-market but we appreciate that um but there's that and then there's just you know having to manage and train somebody of a very junior level um it's going to drag you and a lot of people down if you're the if you're the manager to to be just you know tying their shoes and cutting their stakes we say over here um versus just saying like you know let me know where you need some air cover let's let's meet a few times a week let's you know and go through there and they're able to um really take on a lot of things on their own they're able to see you know they've got the pattern recognition uh they're able to come up with process improvements and things like that um so that's that's something i want to call out i see a lot of people like oh we only budgeted 60k for a you know implementation person so i guess that's what we're going to do and it's like Let's think about the big picture here, you, especially in the beginning where you need a hundred percent referenceability for your customers. So, yeah. Great point that, you know, those initial customers, they're the ones who are gonna, you know, talk you up to the next bunch of customers. So you better do a good job there. I'm yep. curious, you know, you, you know, we, we talked about some of these skills, right? You talked about project management, you talked about the EQ, you talked about pattern detection, mm -hmm. uh, and we do know that certain kinds of products probably also need a little bit of, you know, solutioning muscle so that when the customer is going through the journey, you're not always running back to the support team or tech team. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure there is also an aspect of building that relationship a little more. If there were a bunch of skills, what would that list of things to look out for in that first person look like? If you're not necessarily, you don't have the budget to hire that very experienced person who's done exactly this, but you're looking for a proxy, someone with some experience, maybe mm. they've worked for a few years, but you know, they want to break into this. What skills would you look out for? You know, a lot of people pattern it towards the, like what that first CSM is going to look like. And I, and I just, uh, and I've made that mistake as well too. Whereas, and that's a different skill set that you need to hire for. Um, I always say the CSMs are the huggers and the, uh, and the people on the implementation team are a little bit more of the like, here we go, move you along, great, enjoyed the experience, right? Like, and there's definitely, so, you know, if somebody's brand new, 
like maybe they took some project and we're talking about like the management of the customer here not it, let's take let's remove the very technical configuration you know maybe somebody's having to write some python or something like that um but if we're talking about this first role and your project product maybe has some you know just 30 days get them live some easy configuration stuff um you know did they take some project management tools right like do, or, or any cert certifications and i don't mean pmp i, I will also say Based on my experience, people that are, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say here, uh, people that are a little bit too on the PMP side can't really navigate the um, ups and downs and transient flows of pro products, right? And so nobody wants to be ground down via professional project manager when you're when they're trying to set up in your software. It's, 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 a, little, it's a little nuanced thing. So I would prefer to have somebody um without that you know i can go manage the building of a space shuttle project plan and um and be a little bit uh, more on the customer empathy side what i've seen when you do bring that pmp is, is like oh we needed that file by monday now we have a day for day um you know push on the schedule it's like well that's do we really need to have, talk like that like save the big guns for when you need them things like that um, but you don't want the rumor going around like, oh, well, you, you know, I hated working with these people. I can tell you, I think we were on a different panel where we talked about this, where a salesperson at the company I was working at lost a deal. Let's say they lost this deal in Q4, three weeks into January, they call up the, the person they lost, you know, their prospect and said, hey, how's everything going with our competitor? And they say, we hate working with that team. If you can get us a kickoff meeting this week, we'll switch over to you. And it happens a lot. Uh, you know, I've seen it so many times. And so it's these first impressions um, are so important. So you've got to run them through the personality stuff, the culture thing. Are you flexible? I, I, I'll be honest with you. If, if people worked in the service industry, Starbucks and restaurants and things like that, like they get it, like they get, you know, and then they maybe went to school or they have that blended in or they worked retail. But um, those are a little bit more of those softer skills that I look for. Um, and then maybe, you know, getting them with some, you know, there's some great courseware that out there, you can just take it from your house and learn some of the basics and things like that. So got it. And I'm sure there's like, smart people who can find the right resources online, connect yeah. with the right people and, you know, get some amount of it going as well um we see it about... flight, right like hey what's a good course for x and things like that people are they they find out that's the place to go to ask questions and they you know they rely on people and get mentored and things like that so yeah yeah makes sense um what about you know the second and the third person on the team would you yeah, then start yeah. optimizing for some other skills yeah so I took a lot of notes here, you know, a lot of thoughts going on. And then it was like, do we talk about this stage of a company as you move to the next stage company? But I'm going to say we're building from the ground up. You're, you know, building your startup team. Maybe you brought this configurator on. Maybe, you've, maybe you've got the project manager in place. Um, and then customers are live. Let's just assume you've gotten to the point where customers are live and you can hire a CSM to take care of them. Cause otherwise you start getting into a lot of if then statements. Um, you know, I, I, you know, you need support. Um, and a lot of people do hire their first CSMs to also manage support. Um, it's actually not that bad of a, a thing to do. But again, you don't want to do that for too long. Um, but you do need somebody to answer support tickets and things like that. So the reason why I'm talking about this is support team members can be a really great farm team to then promote into your implementation team. Uh, they're working with customers, uh, they're getting into the details, they're going to have to triage, they really know how things work. Like I, I will tell you, uh, you know, very, very bold opinion here, but like nobody knows the product better than the implementation and the support teams because they're using it every day. Even the people building it, unless you're the system-wide architect, they might not know the entire 
you know, complexities and things like that. So, so if we're just talking, you know, a standard middle of the road thing with some tweaks and bells and things like that, you know, you start then building that organization up. Do you then like get like a player coach to start managing them? Uh, when do you bring your first exec in? Um, you know, I, I'm a big fan of, you know, having somebody come in and set it up that's professional like our team and then walk away and hire people that are more like director level um give them give them something that is a is a really professional way to go and then they can take that and run versus having to kind of like break break a lot of things along the way but you definitely need some management of that team in the management of that team is is best done by people who know what those problems are um i call it the ups philosophy because everybody that starts at ups even if you got hired as the new ceo first week you're in the trucks and you're sorting packages and you know building walls and things like that um and that's and that's super helpful so i see support as a farm team and i was taking notes like a support even just a support person coming in can turn in themselves and become an implementation consultant that's an easy one they could also say maybe i want to be that implementation engineer right and and there's a question for you do you like work talking with people or do you not like talking with people? Do you, do you, you know, do you want to do status reports and things like that? Do you want to say, Hey, where's those files? You just want to go like heads down. Don't bother me. I'm working on a ton of tech stuff and things. Do you, would you rather talk to the customers or go talk to the dev team? Um, and then maybe, you know, having that person also just become that higher level PM role as well too. Um, I've certainly had orgs where you've got a PM, a regular implementation consultant, um, and then you might have even like a solution architect. Um, and these solution ar architect, again, we're talking B two B here. Very important when your when your solution and your product is complex. It's, you know, um, I feel there's a line where your pre sales engineer, your sales engineer person they understand the features and the functions, but they don't have the I'm using it every day, being able to answer a lot of questions in pre-sales. And then um, and then so, yeah, we can do that. We can do it. And then your team comes in and you're like, oh, my God, this is terrible. Like, how could we have avoided this? Right. And it's like, OK, let's let's bring in somebody that's at of a higher level on the implementation team that knows the use cases, knows how to set it up within the software. So it's usually one of these implementation engineers or consultants that has now graduated to a solutions architect person. Could they be a solutions architect at IBM? Uh, no, that, that's it's a solution architect for being able to take the business uh, needs of your customer and translate them into your product and then get them up and running and successful. They should work, you know, if there's complicated stuff like with integrations and APIs and things like that, they're probably talking to uh, the product team and development team saying, we've got a hot prospect, high ARR if they sign, but they need to be able to do X, Y, and Z. I was thinking I would go maybe do X, Y, and Z with the API. Are you guys okay with that? You know, and be able to have those types of conversations or instruct the customer on how to do it themselves and everything. And I've seen this as sort of that next person to hire, next level thing, especially when you do a bunch of um, uh, retrospectives on why projects took so long or why were they complicated or what are some things. It's usually like we needed to to proactively know what the solution was going to be before the deal was signed and um and that's a role that um if you can swing it and if you if your solution need needs that um they're very very instrumental in in your customer happiness and success and time to value and things like that yeah like i don't think Got you it. would need this but but uh you know i don't know uh, but uh but you know, when I when the land of complex integrations and you're doing Zapier stuff all day long and you're doing data cleansing and um, yeah, it just becomes one of those things where you you need a resource like this. Yeah, we have actually seen that need in in some of our larger accounts. Uh, and I'm curious, I've seen this in a few startups where it's more of that, you know, three week to one month mm -hmm. simple configuration sort of thing where. The pre-sale engineer who's like with the salesperson doing the demos, the, the responsibility to implement the first few customers falls on that person sometimes mm -hmm. to say, mm -hmm. hey, you also set it up. Do you think there is merit in having that going for 
for a while or yeah it, it all depends on your solution you just thought and i think i cleansed it um, you, um since we are on video um let me see if i can screen share this um, which is a very common thing that I see, but I got to make sure that it doesn't have the customer name here. Um, yeah, let's see. Um, and the reason why I'm bringing this up is it, it gets into that it it depends conversation that we had. So let me, um, the, the and I'm going to give you the scenario where I see this happen a lot. Um, can you see this uh, Miro chart in front of me here? You can see the chart, but we may need to zoom in a bit to i'm gonna I, I will but it's it's funny because the yeah. what these things show is not as important but i will i will zoom in a little bit um but i can make this available afterwards as well too i'm trying to figure out why preview is not letting me zoom here but uh um oh here we go okay so the reason why i'm bringing this up here is because this is a solution where um the pre-sales engineering team very you know they're selling a developer product to development teams and um it's one of those situations where you it's really hard to understand the value that you're going to get out of the product unless you go through a, a a proof of concept that is very close to a production level scenario um you know obviously you know i don't think salesforce needs to do this anymore but you know when you're it's a it's a new market they're they're creating a new market for themselves and um and so this is something i worked with their team to get everything from the day that the salesperson has said what we're, we're agreeing to a poc all the way over it's taking its time, but what I'm going to, this is basically, I'm gonna, not going to keep scrolling, but as I say, this customer is now um, speaking a, about you at your user conference about how much they love you. Like that's, that's, you know, perfect scenario right there, right? And as you see here, the, the sales engineer, they come in here and they set it up. What do they not do? They don't set up like complicated things like SSO. They don't. They don't do. You know, they basically get the base level. What can you? What can we get you using thirty days and get value out of without having to really open up the guts, right? And so um, it's hard to see the color coding and who does what, but you'll see subject matter experts and things here. Um, but essentially. What happens is that if the customer says in this whole POC phase, which is in the blue and the gray, we really like it, we want to go on board, they then hand over to the implementation team to basically make it production ready. But they've done a lot of the, uh, you know, I would say a medium amount of the heavy lifting, but now the implementation team will come in and say, thanks for getting this set up. Um, now we're going to take 45 days and um, uh, do all the a complicated stuff like the um, like the SSO and all the other things. We're trying not to give away what this customer does. So, and then they will also work on building out more of those value proposition things. Like, how do we know you're gonna, you know, you as you know, I like to say, get your joint success criteria up front. That this is being reinforced all throughout this um, this Miro flow that you're seeing here. And then um, now that we know what your joint success criteria is, we're going to build those workflows to um, what you um, want so they can get your value. And then we're going to hand it off to the CSM team um, so that they can then reinforce and make sure that you are seeing value and going from there. So well, so think about what we talked about in there. I'm going to stop my share. Um, that's not, hey, we're going to go check some boxes and get you on your way, right? And so when we think about personalities and good EQ, are you able to hear what the customer needs to do and then translate that in your software so that they can see some immediate value um, and, then, and then hand it off to the CS team so that they're then reinforcing that value strategy. And um, I believe that's a good combination of these technical resources and somebody with a good subject matter expertise. Um, as your teams get bigger, they might get verticalized. And so you've got the team that's always working with, you know, package good companies or finance companies, and they know the questions to ask. And, and so you, you, you might start bringing in team members that have subject matter expertise in these verticals if you're a vertically focused solution and things like that. So, yeah, as you see, there's a lot we could talk about.
Oh, but I think that's a good sort of like, um, you know, starting from that one resource and getting up to like a big team. Maybe you've got QA people that are making sure that the solution's working correctly. Um, you know, th those are some other resources that I've seen. I really believe, and we're seeing this a lot now in over the last six months, the value of bringing in customer education, customer learning early. Um, it's more scalable. The only way to scale is to be a little lower touch and having a, a really just base fundamental education um, framework and then you're able to build on top of that um, is super important. And if you bring it in early, your early on customers um, are going to really see the benefit from that. One thought on that. I think in 2021, we could bring all the people we wanted as early <laughs> as we needed to. Yeah. How do we do that in 2022 when when money isn't free anymore? Yeah, it, it's it. You know, I it, it all breaks down to the the jobs to be done framework and what are the jobs that are critical that need to be done and you know make sure that those are in place as well too. Like we know people need to be talking to the customer and we know people need to be doing these tech tasks. So let's do that, right? Um, so you, you might not have a subject matter expertise that's just sitting around waiting for. Um, you know, the next the next presentation to go give at a at a prospect uh, or things like that. Um, support, you know, gets a little tougher to staff. Um, people, people are expected to do a little bit more. That's why I think it's important to, um, you know, have these scaling things in place where you need them, even if you're not going to go super low tech touch, there are, there are things that you can do in your customer journey that maybe every company um, doesn't have to have a white glove thing for you don't have to do that here's how do you click on a spreadsheet to load in data that can be a video little things like that you could go and this is a topic for a different thing but you could look at your entire customer journey and say well where are the areas where we could replace some of this with with learning um, and, and then um, and build those out and then you don't have as heavy of a team needed uh, to be able to get these customers up and running yeah Cool. Uh, Jeff, you know, if you were to hire this first person on behalf of one of the startups you're consulting with, yep. what are like two questions that you would ask them in the interview to, you know, see if they're a good fit? Um, I will always ask about their ability to deal with conflict and how what their con conflict resolution skills are. And uh, and make sure that's internal and external, and go from there. And I do like to get into some uh, some type of project management types of activities, which is not exactly conflict resolution, although it's an important skill set. But if I had to hire one person, the best person is a uh, former developer turned project manager. They're they're just able <laughs> to do a lot, um, or or a project manager maybe you know won't, tried to be a developer and you know couldn't do it or went off and took a little boot camp or something like that. But just understand what I'm trying to get around is people like oh that's technical I don't know I got to push that over somebody else. Um, so I would ask about um, it depends again don't want to say it depends but what is your solution. If I'm working with a customer and they're very API focused, I'm going to ask them if they know what an API is. I'm not expecting them to code, but I don't want them to be like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> so, uh, and you know, so are and are you able? Like, what do you do when you are not sure of what's going on? I can tell you, I'd be on conference calls when I was a project manager, and I'd have Wikipedia open or something in another tab, and as soon as the term came up, I'm like, what does that mean? Look it up. Okay, good. And and that's that sort of mentality that that I would I would sort of feel. Are you inquisitive and things like that? So this, I'm given three or four answers now. But you know who answer who asks just two questions on an interview? So <laughs> yeah, but in, in, incidentally, one of the questions I usually ask the like people interviewing for like an onboarding implementation role is, what's the difference between API and webhook? Just to see if like. Are they curious enough to have? Oh, interesting. That's a good one. I like that one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, in, yeah. And I wouldn't expect everybody to be able to answer that, but I would love for somebody to be able to say, I would look that up and I'd make sure I have the understanding and go from there, which, cause you know, a lot of people, um, get into trouble 
by trying to solution on the fly versus like, let me go look that up for you and get that answer right back to you. Um, and, and I would prefer somebody took that approach of like, you know what, I'm not quite sure. Let me go look up. I'll go open up this now or whatever. Um, and, and I would prefer that approach um, to see if they're able to understand. Um, now, obviously, there's a divide and a chasm where people just might not be able to get that. So you're trying to see, like, what is an API? Like, if they don't even know what that is, I'm like, I'm sorry. That's kind of something that's a little table stakes there. So super. Uh, yeah. we, we move to like the final part of the podcast episode. Yeah. Uh, it's a quick rapid fire couple uh -oh. of personal things. Okay. Uh, what's one habit you picked in 2022 that you're going to continue in 2023? You know what? I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but I got super busy for a while on some projects and I stopped sending out and creating agendas for meetings. And um, in that, I kind of got called out for it by a coworker um, in my company. And not even say like, hey, you should be doing X, Y, and Z, but like, hey, did you prepare that for this meeting? I was like, oh, wait. And so I went back to doing that. And then for all of my customer meetings and the productivity difference was amazing, right? Um, so that is uh, that is a habit that I have, I've gotten. The other thing is I've, I went back to the old paper notebook spiral bound that you see here in pencil. And that has been super helpful for me because my when I write with a pen, I can't even read my own writing. I tried everything, the rocket book where you write it and scan it in and all that stuff just is. Yeah. And then anything that needs to get done gets on this little green sticky note that doesn't hold too many things because who can do that much in a day? So. Awesome. Uh, one other question. Is there a book or a, a show or a video or podcast, something that you came across recently that you would recommend to others watching this? Yes, but I'm going to have to, I'd have to look it up or tell people how to look it up. There is a, um, I believe it was a Netflix movie and you probably have seen this. It was about the creation of that, um, that old Apple phone back in the day. Um, and, uh, and then that they didn't make it, you know, um, or, uh, was I the Newton, it was all about the creation of the Newton. Um, and how it was just too early for its time. And then basically, I can't remember if it was 10 or 20 people that were on that project. They basically went to different companies and they and then they wound up basically creating the iPhone and basically changed the world as it is. And, uh, it may sound dry by the way I'm describing it, but it's an amazing movie. Uh, one of my customers, um, they show it off to every new hire. Um, as you know, it's like one of their things like, hey, go watch this movie with the founder. And, uh, and they watch that movie. And at first I was like, oh, here we go. And I was like, this is an amazing movie. And I did, uh, the, you know, I can't remember um the name and then they released a book called builder or something like that but uh that one if you're listening to this podcast and you haven't seen that movie i would check that out because it's uh it's it's highly recommended for me oh I, never, I i found it i found it now it's called general magic it's called general magic the movie you could if you google general magic the movie you can you can find everything that you're looking for right there it's great all right awesome thanks for that one last question before we end the episode, Jeff. Yeah. And this is if you're talking to that candidate who's come for an interview or has just been selected in the role, what advice will you give them as they step into the role as the first onboarding uh, implementation manager? Ask as many questions as you can. Um, don't be surprised if we don't have the answer. And then also don't be surprised if there's not a lot of process here. When I worked in downtown Boston, um, uh, like had an office there and everything, and people were like, wait, that's not documented or where's the process around that? And I used to be able to point to the Fidelity building and see like, see that if, if you want all that process right now, you go there, you'll be bored out of your mind. But, um, but everything is written down and all the standard operating procedures are there. But I would say what I would appreciate is for you to be a contributor and point out anything that's missing so that we can work on these things. And it's a huge opportunity for you to define what the rest of this department and how we do things are, uh, are gonna be. 
Awesome. Yeah, it's the responsibility of this. They, they become the face of the company in that most important partnership. So they yeah. better call us out if they say something. <laughs> Absolutely. Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Cool. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and sharing all of these inputs and tips and, and uh, insights, Jeff. Oh, it was fun because everybody just usually hears me talking about charging money for implementation and, you know, all these, <laughs> these things. So there's uh, there's definitely a lot of stuff we can talk about and staffing is pretty much one of the most important things. So I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to to uh, share some of my experiences and, and thoughts. And and I can guarantee you uh, my way is not the only way of doing it. Um, so uh, love to hear from anybody that uh, challenges me on that. I'm always I love being wrong. So. Awesome. Thank you.